Good evening, everyone. Hope you all are well and keeping warm. Thank you for taking our time to join another session of Child Mental Health Community of Practice, Depression, Suicidality, and Self-Harm. We would like to formally start our session by acknowledgement of country. Northwestern Melbourne Primary Health Network would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of land on which our work takes place, the Wurundjeri Wurrung people, Boon Wurrung people, and Wadurung people. We pay respects to elders past, present, and emerging, as well as pay respects to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the session with us today. Before we kickstart our session, just looking at some community of practice guidelines. Please stay on mute unless speaking, raise your hand to speak, keep conversations confidential, and if possible, please keep your camera on. Introduce yourself when, and your role when speaking, and acknowledge that we have varied learning needs and interests. Ask questions as no questions are silly. During the education component, please ask questions via the chat box. The session is being recorded. Please ensure that you join the session using the name you registered with so we can mark your attendance. Certificates and CPD will not be issued if we cannot confirm your attendance. So just on how we, we can change your name in Zoom meetings. So if you have joined through the app, you click on your name. And if you have joined to the desktop, just hover over your name and click the three dots. And through Mac, click more, click on rename and enter your name and you're good to go. I would like to introduce our psychiatrist and presenter for today, Dr. Prakash. Dr. Prakash is a senior consultant, child and adolescent psychiatrist at RCH with over 20 years experience. He has worked in and manage general and specialist clinics within child psychiatry in metropolitan and regional public mental health services. He has worked with children and adolescents from four to 18 years of age, assessing and managing a variety of mental health issues. And I'm Saha, I'm a GP who works in Sambri and my areas of interest are child and adolescent mental health and chronic disease management. I am going to request Dr. Prakash to present the education component for tonight. Over to you, Dr. Prakash. Thank you very much, Dr. Sahar. Um, we will be discussing very briefly the management of depression and suicide. It is quite a large topic. So we are just going to be talking about that briefly. Dr. Sahar, are you able to share the slides or do you want I me to sure do can. Yeah, uh, I'm more than, it's it's not in this slide deck, but I can open that slide deck. That's not a problem. Just oh, give thank me. you. That's very kind of you. Yeah, it's just the right. other is I can do it as well. No, no, it's okay. It's um, just here. Thank you. Thank you so much. So we'll cover as briefly and succinctly as possible this topic but making sure that I give you information on the latest in thinking in this area as well, whilst we are at it. Thank you. We'll start with a discussion on what's called as the concept of death. Um, a lot of people have sort of tried to define the age at which a child um, is able to understand that death is final. We've moved away from that kind of thinking and we've moved on to this sort of thinking that there are five criteria that are often used to determine if what the level of understanding of a child is in relation to death. The first one is the concept of universality, which is that the realization that everyone who's born must die some day in some way or the other, um, natural accidents, illness, whatever causes, or by suicide, and that no one lives forever. But the cause of death is the failure of vital organs in the body, such as the heart, brain, and other organs. And that is different to the mode of death, which is natural accident, suicide, murder, that kind of stuff. The third concept is the concept of permanence or irreversibility, that those who die cannot be brought back and will not return on their own. The fourth one is non-functionality, which is that when a person dies, their body and their organs will no longer function. So it's that, you know, the people talking to them or reaching out and touching them, that they are, that they would be part of a grief process or something like that. Um, 
And then there is the concept of extracorporeal identity or non-corporeal continuation. And we've added the fifth concept because there are a lot of cultures around the world and spiritual beliefs that believe that beyond the physical self, which is the body, the mind, the intellect and cognitive capacity, which is the functioning of the brain, um, there is something else, which is the sense of self, which observes life from within. And some types of therapies like acceptance and commitment therapy actually actually kind of have the the self the the, the witnessing self as an, an integral part of um, how they communicate in therapy so extracorporeal identity or non-corporeal kind of one studies show that school age children between 6 and 12 years 71 percent seem to understand that death is final although the word suicide was not familiar to most of the grades one and two the idea of killing oneself was understood by quite a significant number of very young children so they understood that some people kill themselves and that may be through exposure in the media exposure on television websites family members who may take their own lives and things like that, or people that they know of. Two thirds of first graders express the belief that dead people can still have experiences like seeing and hearing. And in the age of six to 12, typically have had four to five death related experiences in their lives. So a sibling or parent, grandparent, friend, somebody known to them, or just somebody you know that they watched on television. Uh, either dying or being killed or any of that sort of stuff. Okay, so that's the concept of death. Now, after a mental health assessment, we tend to create a formulation. And a formulation is really important because it helps guide the focus of treatment, especially psychological therapy in depression and suicide. It helps to choose the type of therapy that is more most likely to work and most likely to be useful for the consumer. And ratings of suicide risk based on a Likert type scale of low, moderate, and high, um, which is a prediction focused scale, is not evidence-based. There is no way that we can predict low, moderate, or high levels. Um, and so a more useful approach is the creation of a risk formulation that is based in the aim of prevention rather than prediction. So, Based on that, this is what is called a suicide risk prevention formulation. It was created by a man called Anthony Pisani uh, in the US. He's a child and adolescent psychologist um, and is a professor um, in the university there. And he's created this sort of formulation. So on the left-hand side, you have all of the clinical data that we we obtain, which is we have the history, mental state examination, past history of suicidal behavior, past history of self-harming, recent and current suicidal behavior, the stressors and precipitant symptoms, and what changes um, there might be in the symptoms, engagement with treatment, alliance, therapeutic alliance with the therapist, is medication working or not, all those things. And from that, we try to get the strengths and protective factors, the long-term risk factors, whether there are you know, impulsivity and self-control issues through the use of substances or ADHD and all of that. So with all of that clinical data, we write a formulation. The formulation has four parts to it. First one is called as risk status. Risk status is a description of the risk of the individual when compared with others in a stated population. When I say a stated population, it could very well be, for example, if you are seeing a young person in your clinic, um, your risk assessment of this person, the young person sitting in front of you, compared with the risk status of the last five or 10 adolescents that you've seen, either that day or over the preceding few weeks, you will have a kind of a gut feeling that this is the most risky child that I've seen or risky young person I have seen, because that will then influence or trigger certain decisions in your mind. So risk status is the first one. The second state, second one is called the risk state. If you have been seeing the young person over a period of time, that is when you can actually do a risk state. Otherwise you will have to gather, if you're seeing the young person for the first time, you'll have to gather that information from others who know about the young person, which is relative to that person's own risk at a previous point in time. And there are four time points that they usually talk about. Um, what is the risk of the person now at the time that you are assessing them? 
So that is the second sort of important point that you will have to mention. The third thing is available resources. So there are resources within the person. So they have verbal linguistic skills, they have a, a positive belief in the world, they have, um, they have the ability to understand a therapeutic modality when it is taught to them, they are motivated, they're ready to engage in therapy, all those things. Uh, but there are also other supports like they're probably engaged with the mental health service or they have a good therapeutic relationship with their GP or with their pediatrician or someone um, and they may be willing to divulge to them what might be going on or they are inspired by those um, you know medical practitioners or professionals and you know and and because they are inspired by them and they have a good therapeutic relationship they might be able to be convinced about you know, engaging in treatment. And then there is support of the family, the social environment, school, um, any sports coaches, um, siblings, extended family, friends, all these people. So they're all the available resources. The last um, leg of the formulation, if you will, is to talk about foreseeable changes. So there are some changes that can quickly change the person's risk state from low to high or from, you know, the person is not sort of risky at all to being very risky. For example, there's a breakup with a girlfriend or, or a boyfriend, um, there's court case, there's parents announcing that they're going to separate, uh, being expelled from school, um, friends breaking up, you know, all of that stuff. So that that could all be foreseeable changes. So if you've got that as part of the history, then that would be important to note there as this is the time when the risk is likely to escalate. The next thing to think about is the sort of process of risk prevention. Risk prevention has got six steps to it. The first one is engaging and goal setting with the child or the young person is why are we meeting, what are our goals, you know, that sort of stuff. And then there's a comprehensive child and adolescent mental health assessment, biopsychosocial cultural formulation, which is what we do. And then we do a risk assessment and then a risk formulation writing. And you can write a risk formulation without necessarily having a full-on multidisciplinary child and adolescent mental health assessment. What you need is the information that I mentioned. So a risk formulation and then a collaborative safety plan, which we'll talk about today, and risk prevention plan, an implementation plan, which includes treatment for the underlying problems for which you will refer to um, a mental health professional. And then there is the ongoing care and review of how things are going. In terms of the sequence of a risk assessment, the first thing is information related to the person's suicidal intent will be obtained. Analysis of potential risk and protective factors that you might gather through the history and mental state. Identifying acute warning signs of suicide, completing a mental state examination and completing a risk formulation. So some of the warning signs for suicide could be, you know, the person has written a suicide note or they're giving away all their possessions or they're saying goodbye, they're sending goodbye text messages and things like that. So the warning sign that they're probably escalating the risk of suicide. In terms of risk prevention and care and the communication pathway, we've, we, we've got a concept called CARE, which is connect, assess, respond, extend. So connecting is that initial part where you engage the young person, you work on the goals, you work on why are we meeting, what are we wanting to achieve, what do you want to achieve from this, what do I want to achieve from this, kind of, you know, kind of um, have a therapeutic agreement or an alliance. The next one is assessing assessing and then writing a formulation. Yes, you will receive a copy of the slides, yeah. Um, you will assess and write a formulation um, that is part, part of the you know, risk formulation. Once that risk formulation is done, then you respond. You respond through a safety plan, you respond to treatment and interventions. Um, you, 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 know, you talk to people about how often they should have contact with the person. You know, you may suggest to the parents, you know, go and check in on them every hour or every half an hour when they are in their room. Um, or you might decide how often you want to see them, you know, every week or every fortnightly or whatever. Or you might just decide to send them to a mental health service. And then if you do have other people in your practice, then you might want to discuss with them. But if you're referring to a mental health service, there'd often be a team discussion, consultation, all those things. But apart from that, 
there could be other things like for example um so you know sort of extending that information with the permission of the young person to the main support people um sharing the plans and the safety plans with the family um you know having a even making a contract with them saying i'm going to see you weekly to work on these things i might start you on an antidepressant or i'm going to have conversations with you about that i want to check check in on you and see how you're going so you actually make the appointments in front of them um and you give them the appointments that said this this these are your appointment times and dates um which is kind of helpful because they a, think that you care. The second thing is that the structure of the appointments helps them to sort of, you know, stay focused on recovery as well. And then there's warm handoff. So, for example, if you, um, a handover, for example, if you refer to a mental health service and calling their triage line or pass, passing your phone number to them so that they can call you to speak and all of that would be quite helpful. In terms of the treatment of depression, there's the acute phase, the maintenance phase, and the continuation phase. The acute phase is the initial period, which ranges from two weeks to two months. What you're aiming to do is to try to reduce the severity of the symptoms by at least 50%. There are different rating scales that people sometimes use. Or you could also just generally have your own sort of list of questions you go through and ask, do you think it's less than, you know, less by 50%? And you can ask the parents and other people and form your own judgment. But a lot of people use rating scales. And based on the scores that the person um, gets out of, gets, then you can kind of decide if they've reached 50%. The maintenance phase is to consolidate the gains in the acute phase and preventing relapse and the continuation phase is you know is known as a recovery phase where the aim is to maintain them on a low dose of medication continue on with therapies which sometimes might be fortnightly and then might sort of face off to monthly and then eventually might finish off so this, those are the sort of three things <laughs> Um, <laughs> improving insomnia and reducing suicidality is quite an important thing. A uh, professor of um, adolescent suicidality in the United States, um, David Brent, he's a doyen of uh, suicidology and he advises the president of the United States in terms of youth mental health and suicide prevention. One of the things he keeps talking about is how much insomnia is associated with suicide risk and studies show that sleep disturbance may be a marker of distress that leads to suicide risk but also sleep disturbance may confer greater risk of suicide uh, through increasing impulsivity and things like that. And if the person has multiple different types of sleep problems, so there's initial insomnia, there's frequent waking in between, and there's waking too early in the morning, there's nightmares and uh, post-traumatic stress symptoms in the middle of the night and, and various things, or if there's parasomnia, there's uh, obstructive sleep apnea, all these things, they actually confer a greater suicide risk than just simple, you know, initial insomnia. So it's the recommended focus in specialist mental health services now, but it can also be done in general practices and pediatric practices is sleep disturbance screening, a very simple tool can sometimes be helpful, an insomnia scale, which asks you some of the questions can be helpful, and then actually treating that sleep is, is quite helpful. It is very important to not minimize that and um, see people who come to you talking about sleep disturbance as people who are kind of drug seeking or something because some of them may be but for a lot of young people that is a very significant problem and that is directly related to a suicide risk of I've, I've had at least two patients who've taken their own life in the middle of the night because they had insomnia which was not picked up by the service that was treating them and uh, effectively managing that there is also a, a form of cognitive behavior therapy called CB, CBT for insomnia, which has good evidence base, but it does require motivation and engagement from the consumer. That's the problem with all forms of CBT is that, you know, you kind of, the young person has to engage in the treatment. Otherwise, it sort of doesn't work. Melatonin can be effective in young people, particularly with ASD sleep problems, but also in neurotypical kids. There's clonidine, zopiclone that you can use. Prazosin can be used in, um, you know, sort of PTSD-related nightmares, one to three milligrams. 
In terms of other treatments, is cardiovascular exercise and um, you know, treatment of depression. So physical activity is associated with um, decreased concurrent depressive symptoms, um, although future depressive symptoms is sort of weak. I think immediately people find an improvement in depression. And so I think um, suggesting physical activity, especially in the acute phase of depression is a good thing because it does certainly help for a, for a short period of time. And then obviously other treatments have to be implemented anyway, which would maintain that improvement. Um, the, the association between cardiovascular exercise and depression treatment was stronger when seen for you know, in, in cross-sectional studies um, for short periods of time, not longitudinal studies. So I think over a period of time, the effect seems to wear off. So it, this should be part of a smorgasbord of treatment um, rather than just on its own. But um, physical activity of increased frequency and intensity was more associated with decreased depressive symptoms than sort of very sedentary, mild physical activity type things. In any therapeutic engagement, there are three parts. And they are the, the sort of um, emotional bond, forming an emotional bond with the person, then alignment of goals, and then the alignment of tasks. So in terms of the emotional bond, it's very important to convey to the young person that you, you, you are going to try to get them. You get, you get them a little bit. You don't, you don't understand all of it as, as a fellow human being, as a professional who sees a lot of young people like them. You have heard this before. You've seen this before. That sort of messaging is really important, and that forming that emotional bond is quite important. Um, that they look upon you as somebody that who's willing to help. Um, not necessarily that you can make everything go away, but you're willing to help, and that's really important. The other is alignment of the goals. What does the young person want, and what do you want? And being honest about that is is quite important as well. And then there's the alignment of tasks. Um, which are important, such as we need to kind of get, you know, we need to have an agreement with them about how often you will see them, which psychologist or mental health professional they will see, and, and you know, so on and so forth. And if there's any medication involved, then taking that medication and making sure that they, they comply with the safety plan and all of that, they adhere to the safety plan. Just a brief overview of the psychological therapies. Um, what works is promoting engagement in therapy through motivational interviewing. Um, there is a form of intervention called therapeutic assessment. And if you Google therapeutic assessment, you'll find um, information on a particular intervention that is done in people with an intellectual disability or ASD. That's not what we're talking about here. There's another therapeutic assessment, which is a technique for crisis intervention and problem solving, which has been found to be really helpful. Uh, psychoeducation is an essential part of promoting engagement in therapy and some studies have been shown that psychoeducation has been quite effective as a standalone intervention both in young people and in parents in particular. It makes parents feel empowered um, and able to keep the young people safe. Routine specialist care um, that includes non-specific individual family or group work has also been found to be helpful. So even just routinely seeing patients and, and speaking to them about different things and continuing to stay involved and engaging them is actually quite helpful. Um, and sometimes when um, pediatricians and GPs do that side by side with the person seeing a psychologist or somebody else, but actually it's quite helpful in holding the young person and holding the family as well. In terms of CBT, there's numerous meta-analysis that's shown that it helps in adolescent depression and there is a computer-based CBT now, uh, which started off very much during the pandemic and was trialed in various studies and also been found to be a valid treatment. There is a specific CBT which for suicide prevention called CBTSP, um, which focuses on risk reduction and relapse prevention. Um, there are some other therapies like uh, dialectical behavior therapy, which uh, targeted therapies for suicidal and depressed youth. And, the, and both CBT and DBT have an acute phase and continuation phase. 
um, each for 12 sessions. So it's a 24 session treatment um, and CBT um, suicide prevention, which combines CBT and DBT strategies includes a chain analysis. So what happened with the suicidal event? Uh, how did it get triggered? When did the thought come? How did the thoughts then increase? Where were you when it happened? What did you do at that time? Who was with you? What did you do when you took the tablets in your hand? When did you make the decision to go and get the tablets? What did you do with the tablets in your hand? When did you decide to put them in? How did you feel when you put them? It's a complete breaking down and dis and and a detailed discussion about the 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 events that led to the suicide event, and and. And through that process, we kind of look at the various stages at which we can intervene and then draw a safety plan. And there is skill building, teaching people to tolerate distress within themselves, teaching their families to help the young people with distress tolerance, problem solving skills training, um, family communication and attachment informed safety planning, and all of that stuff, and, and medication use as well when needed. In terms of other uh, treatments and interventions is dialectical behavior therapy, where essentially it comes from Buddhist philosophies and Eastern Hindu philosophy. Um, and the person, and it's been sort of from Hindu to Buddhism and from Buddhism, it has gone into kind of certain textbooks of psychology and certain people's um, sort of learning of these techniques and using them in therapy. So Marsha Linehan, who created dialectical behavior therapy is very much influenced by Eastern philosophies. And essentially the thing is to treat or accept life as a balance between pleasant and unpleasant. And it teaches people that, you know, you're never going to have everything perfect. You're never going to have everything go your way. And um, you will be di distressed at certain points in time. That is normal. That is natural. And, you know, I think expecting to feel distressed in distressing situations is actually quite a normal thing. And it teaches people to deal with that distress. It teaches people to remain centered in the, in the current moment which is called mindfulness. It teaches people how to communicate with other people effectively, how to manage and um, um, manage their emotions in interpersonal contexts effectively, which is called interpersonal effectiveness. So that's the sort of concept of dialectical behavior therapy. Mentalization-based therapy, <clears throat> um, which, is, which was created by people in the UK, teaches young people to be aware of their own mental state and other people's mental states. So, you know, I'm in this situation, this is what other people may be thinking of me. And this is how I may be thinking of what they think of me and how do you then sort of relate to each other using that kind of um, thing. So what it does is that it teaches young people um, to be mindful of dissonance between their assumptions of other people and what other people may think of them and what the reality may be. So mentalization-based therapy really approaches adolescent depression from the point of view um, of the fact that a lot of adolescents feel depressed because they feel that their own negative view of themselves is what others feel about them as well. And then they, that sort of becomes ingrained in their thinking both about themselves and about their relationships with other people. So it tries to unpack that and change that. And it's a it's an effective treatment, both run in both therapies, DBT and MBT are effective both at individual level and group levels. And um, MBT certainly used in inpatient units as is DBT. But one of the, the advantages of MBT is you don't need to actually prepare a session or anything like that. The young person can just walk in and you can just launch into a conversation about, um, you know, something that's happened over the last week and you can just kind of go, oh, how have you been doing? What did you do since we last met? Where did you go? Who did you meet? What happened there? What did you feel about that? And then that can start to sort of evolve into a mentalization-based discussion. So that is one of the, uh, the attractiveness. You don't need a manual, you don't need to consult, you don't go through steps, you don't have to get the young person to do homework tasks, all of that stuff. And it's certainly something that anyone can do. And, and the psychiatrist that I was working with here at the Children's Hospital who routinely uses in his private practice, and he says he does these sessions over 15, 20 minutes even. So it's possible to do it even in a kind of short period of time. 
Acceptance and commitment therapy is certainly um, uh, one of the evidence-based therapies. And basically, it, it teaches people to accept their automatic negative thoughts and the sensations and urges, but rather than embrace them and identify themselves with those thoughts and feelings, it teaches people to try to detach from those feelings and, and, and um, experience their own psychological experiences or their mind more as an observer from outside. And the other thing it teaches people is to be very mindful of who the, where they are and who they are. So everyone has certain certain views or values about their own life. So they have certain values that they wish to be like I I, I and they have beliefs about themselves that you know there's value systems that or value systems that they wish to to reach or achieve. That I feel that I am a um, I'm a kind person, or I feel that I'm an intelligent person, or I feel that I'm a very helpful person to people and so on and so forth. And so what it teaches people to do is be less attached to their feelings and the mind and the workings of the mind and detach from that or diffuse the word is the word used and attach to the higher goals and values of life and try to live those values to achieve um, satisfaction in life and happiness. There are other therapies, you know, like the interpersonal therapy A, which is a time limited 12 to 16 weeks treatment um, with a beginning phase, middle phase and an end phase. And basically what happens there is that a person is sort of, the focus is on how the person became depressed what events happened in their lives, where their losses of particular events, traumas, um, that resulted in them becoming depressed. And it's about sort of working on those events and what happened with those events and how they affected the person's mind and helping them to overcome their depression. Cognitive analytic therapy is again, a more relational based therapy. Um, so through the use of certain diagrams, it sort of helps the person understand that from childhood, they have had a pattern of relating to other people and a pattern of feeling certain feelings about themselves when certain interactions happen. So somebody says something to me, you know, the other day somebody was talking to me about, you know, when they borrowed somebody's push bike, um, this friend used to say, be careful. I don't want you to, you know, um, fall and have scratches on the bike. So this person who took the bike felt, oh, he cares more about his bike than me. He didn't say that he wanted me to be careful so that I don't fall and hurt myself. He was more worried about his bike, which very well might be true. But then that led to that person becoming angry and resentful and then starting to feel that maybe the others are like him and so on and so on and so forth. So this, this experience in childhood at some point seemed to kind of create a a feeling in this person's mind, which then became a pattern of relationships throughout the person's life. And it was also it was also used to kind of look at their internal conversations when they're kind of in those relationships. Another evidence-based intervention is a family-based one, which is really useful to look at creating safety plans and things called attachment-based family therapy. It, it reframes depression as being due to some form of an attachment rupture that the person has had. You know, for example, um, there's a question in the aftermath of a suicide attempt or something like that, or, a, or an attempt at trying to take one's own life. The person comes, the, the therapist asks, why do you think the child did not go to you? It asks the parents. It, it, then it asks the young person, why did you not feel like going to your parents? So back in time when they were young, they would go to the parents if they were hurt, if they were injured, if they were sick, if they were in pain, they would go to their parents for comfort. But that somehow changed. And then the person stopped going to the parent for comfort. When did that start? Now, a lot of people say, oh, you know, that's quite normal or natural uh, when uh, people become teenagers. In fact, research shows that more than 80% adolescents surveyed and even young adults who were surveyed said that the people that they would go to when they were distressed were usually their parents or somebody very close to them, you know, in terms of a strong 
uh, attachment object, not the wider group of friends. So in fact, there were a lot of young people who said, no, I will not go to my friends and talk about this because I have a different relationship with my friends. They are important to me. I will not want to lose them. I don't think that my either my parents are more important or my friends are important. They're just different relationships. So I think young people seem to kind of have a more mature way of um, dealing with this than some of us professionals who just assume these adult things um, that are, oh, you know, young people won't go to their parents. But in fact, the research, research shows that they prefer to go to their parents. But sometimes the parents may not know how to respond uh, when the young person comes to them. So in a way, the therapy teaches both the young person on how to go and communicate their distress to their parents, and it teaches parents on how to react when the young person comes to them feeling distressed and suicidal. Okay, so there's uh, obviously the antidepressants, the various antidepressants that we've got. Um, there's the fluoxetine, the sertraline, and there is um, um, mita so mitazapine and others. And then we have other uh, antidepressants such as, you know, sort of desvendlafaxine, votioxetine. I think the slides have got a bit mixed up. I think if you just quickly go through Dr. Sahar. Thank you. One more. Yeah. So we go through you know, fluoxetine's effectiveness has been studied as a sertraline. We all know that all these studies were funded by the pharm pharmaceutical industry. So, you know, there's some level of skepticism about how well they've reported the adverse effects, but I think the effectiveness studies have subsequently been replicated. We now know that um, also all SSRIs are equal in their suicide risk, that fluoxetine is not safer than the others, except peroxetine, which we do not use. So peroxetine, we do not use. All of the other ones, probably roughly equal. Um, SSRIs reduce the factors behind suicide risk, such as the depressed mood, direct, directly does not um, increase uh, risk of completed suicide or anything. Um, there is, you know, certainly I don't believe that there is any evidence to suggest that um, that SSRIs are directly responsible for increased suicide risk. Okay, so 20 placebo control studies um, with 4,100 pediatric patients, so various SSRIs, and um, whilst there was an increase in suicidal ideation and resultant self-harm with suicidal intent, there was no increase in actual suicide. Um, so the FDA could not rule out an increased risk of suicidality from any of these medications. Um, and so they've kept the kind of black box warning, but they are increasingly advising doctors to sort of, you know, kind of use their clinical sort of skill to make decisions about what treatments they will, you know, what treatment will be ideal for their patients. I think we all know the TAD study. Um, so the TAD study was a 36 week study with a combination of CBD and an SSRI. Um, so the combination of CBD with SSRI was found to be superior to either CBD alone or um, fluoxetine alone. Although the final scores were found, the combination was number one, CBD was number two, and fluoxetine by itself was number three. Um, and majority of the patients seen in that study remitted by nine months. And then there's the Tordia study, which looked at sort of if the first SSRI did not respond, um, then what would you go to? And so it took a group of young people who were treatment resistant to the first um, SSRI, and they were randomized to another SSRI or Wendler vaccine with or without CBT. Um, again, most people seem to respond and um, with treatment, although a quarter of them remit, you know, relapsed. And the best response was for SSRI and CBT. So the, the lesson from this was that if the first SSRI did not work, you try another one, you try another one, and always best to combine that with, with some form of psychological therapy, CBT in this case, um, and monitoring for suicide risk is also quite important. 
There are newer antidepressants, such as the duloxetine, with a half hour of 12 hours. It's useful also in people with chronic pain. And some people have said that it's kind of been helpful in the treatment of ADHD because it increases um, uh, dopamine in the frontal lobe. <laughs> Egomelatine, which works on the melatonin 1 and melatonin 2 receptors and is a 5-HT2C antagonist. Um, some studies have shown that it is better than fluoxetine, but it mainly influences sleep. It in improves sleep, but um, uh, it's not very often used because of concerns about liver injury and there's a need to monitor liver functions in the first eight to 10 weeks of treatment. Okay, the cardiotoxicity and citalopram and escitalopram. Um, there have been lots of sort of case reports of long QTC with citalopram and escitalopram, but there is not enough evidence to say that when you put people on citalopram or you think of starting someone on escitalopram that you have to do a, a ECG to rule out long QT, you would again do that. If there is a family history of long QT, if they, are, if they have other medications they're taking that lengthen the QT interval. Transcranial magnetic stimulation is a non-invasive treatment with sessions that last 30 minutes. Now, Origin are doing some studies in young people. It's available in the um, Albert Road um, private hospital for adolescents. It's a course of 20 sessions um, over 20 days, um, which is what seems to be beneficial, especially if it's applied over the frontal areas of the brain. There are over 30 studies in adults and some increase in, in studies in adolescents now um, that are looking at the effectiveness of TMS. Safety planning. It's not a document that just has to be done. It's a dynamic, ongoing, meaningful, accessible, useful thing and best done through the use of an app, a phone app, because we have a, we, we did a study uh, on the inpatient unit at the RCH and found that the paper versions of the forms no one uses. So there are seven steps to a safety plan. Yeah, the next step, yeah, next slide. Yeah. Seven steps to the safety plan. Step one is to list all the um, warning signs, feelings of hopelessness and like feeling like a burden, uh, distressed feelings, social withdrawal, conflict with people, mood changes. Next one is, what can I do to help myself? You know, I can do various things, like breathing, mindfulness, meditation, going for a walk, all that. The person has to choose them. Uh, what can I do to connect with people, which is the third step, um, and inviting a friend over, going to a busy park with lots of people, joining a team to play sport. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, which family members and friends can I talk to? What can I do to make my environment safe? Like getting rid of medications, getting rid of other objects. And uh, what are the reasons for me to leave? So the person will have a list of reasons. What professional supports can I access? So this is called as a Stanley Brown seven stage safety plan. Normally, when there is a kind of a suicide attempt and you see people in the aftermath of that, we would talk about what were the precipitants, what was the motivation, what was the affect or the feeling experienced at the time? Was it anger? Was it anxiety? Was it depression? I think it's not assumed it's all depression. Sometimes it can be anger, it can be embarrassment, it can be shock, it can be panic, it can be a lot of other things. It could be hopelessness increased. Or was it static at the time? Did you have any emotional regulation problems before the suicide attempt, which worsened at the time of the attempt? Then environmental response to the person right after the attempt is another important thing. And the last one is reducing access to lethal means, which is sort of quite important because studies have shown that when you reduce access to lethal means, the person has to spend some time looking for an alternative method of trying to end their life. And that is a very useful thing because in that time you can actually um, try to prevent their suicide. Thank you. I'm sorry I ran over time, but there was lots of stuff to convey. There are a few references that I'll leave with you. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was so good. Thank you. Um, so just a sec. 
I'm going to go back to the other slide deck. Just a very quick introduction to health pathways for people who are not familiar with them. Um, because we're running a bit late. So health pathways, sorry, health pathways are written by GP clinical editors with support from local GPs, hospital-based specialists, and other subject matter experts. Um, why health pathways were established? To actually provide evidence-based medical care. So there is a reduction in variation of care and how we can refer to the most appropriate hospital, community, health service, or allied health provider, and what services are available for our patients. So if you actually go and log into Health Pathways, there is a really good um, you know, slides and resources regarding depression in children and adolescents and various other mental health concerns that our young people face. Um, if you don't have access to Health Pathways, you can register via this QR code. 